Hello, I'm Ian Paul and this is the third module in the series on mood disorders. It focuses on the diagnostic description of dis depressive disorders that have no identifiable trigger, as well as some of the characteristics of these disorders. This module has three objectives. After finishing it, you should be able to describe the epidemiological features of depressive disorders, recognize the signs and symptoms of these disorders, and be able to form a differential diagnosis among the depressive disorders, as well as somatic disorders presenting with depressive symptomatology. Depressive disorders are common and frequently recur so that at any given time between 5 and 10 percent of the population displays symptoms. Over the course of a lifetime, depressive disorders affect about 15 percent of the U.S. population. However, since women are more likely than men to suffer from a depressive disorder, the lifetime risk for women is much higher. In fact, women are twice as likely as men to suffer from a depressive disorder until about the age of 65, which has led some to hypothesize a permissive role for estrogen in the development of depressive symptoms. In contrast, men are much more likely to commit suicide successfully, largely due to their use of violent methods such as guns, gunshot or jumping from a height. Unlike some other psychiatric disorders, the prevalence of mood disorders is stable across subcultures. Although it has improved over the years, only about 50% of those with major depressive disorder seek treatment. Moreover, the majority of treatment for depressive disorders is received from primary care providers. The age of onset for the depressive disorders is typically between puberty and the mid-twenties. However, episodes occurring during adolescence are often missed. This is likely because the teens tend to be emotionally challenging both for the teenager and for their family, so the symptoms, unless very severe, can often be overlooked in the normal ups and downs of that age. In addition, kids often express mood disorders differently from adults. As an example is the mnemonic MAD equals SAD to describe the fact that children usually express depressed mood as irritability and angry outbursts. Finally, mood dis disorders display significant comorbidity with several other groups of psychiatric disorders. For example, most people diagnosed with depression also display symptoms of an anxiety disorder at times throughout their illness. Interestingly, the comorbidity does not apply equally in the reverse directions. Anxiety disorders frequently appear with no depressive symptoms. Most depressive disorders present with no clearly identifiable trigger. These include major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder, which is often referred to as dysthymia, and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. In addition to these disorders, there are a number of depressive disorders with similar symptomatology, but with a more clearly identifiable trigger. These will be described in Module 4. To begin the description of the depressive disorders, let's start with the prototypical major depressive disorder. The DSM-5 criteria for a diagnosis of major depressive disorder requires one of two core symptoms, sad, depressed mood, or anhedonia. Not uncommonly, patients present with both. The DSM then requires three to four of seven other symptoms for a total of at least five symptoms persisting for at least two weeks. These include four vegetative symptoms such as changes in weight, sleep, or psychomotor activity, or reduced energy and increased fatigue. Notably, the majority of vegetative symptoms are bidirectional. Symptoms are considered present if the patient displays more or less of the symptom than normal. The remaining three fe include feelings of worthlessness or guilt, cognitive impairment, or suicidality. Remember, though, from the unit on suicidality that major depressive disorder only accounts for about 50% of suicide attempts, and many people with MDD never display suicidality. These symptoms are often described by the mnemonic SIG-E-CAPS. 
since that mnemonic leaves out one of the the important core symptom of depressed mood, I normally remember it as da Siggy Caps. A great free tool to assess potential depressive symptoms is the Patient Health Questionnaire 9, or PHQ-9 for short. This instrument has high sensitivity and specificity for MDD. Patients can actually complete this online before their office visit, and several free and subscription apps are available. However, remember its sensitivity and specificity aren't perfect, so don't rely exclusively on it. Medical students are one of the high-risk groups for depressive symptomatology. Yeah, I know, kind of an obvious conclusion. As a wellness tip, I strongly recommend taking the PHQ-9 yourself. Even a low score indicating mild depression deserves attention. Remember, even if the symptoms aren't bothering you too much, you may have impairments of cognition, which are one of the last things a medical student needs. Contact UMC's Student Wellness Center if you need confidential help. There are a number of common psychiatric comorbidities that often accompany major depressive disorder. For example, more than three quarters of patients with MDD exhibit symptoms of an anxiety disorder at some point in their illness. Interestingly, as I mentioned, although people with a primary diagnosis of an anxiety disorder often present with comorbid MDD, the rate is much lower, somewhere between 25 and 50 percent. Another common comorbidity is ADHD, and as with most significant mental health diagnoses, MDD is often accompanied by risky substance use or full-blown substance use disorders. Conversely, when considering a diagnosis of MDD, it's important to rule out other disorders such as bipolar or adjustment disorders, as well as drug-induced and somatic conditions that can present with depressive symptoms. It's important to recognize that many somatic conditions can present with symptoms of MDD. Of particular importance are hypothyroidism, Cushing's disease, and cardiovascular disease and its complications. The occurrence of depressive symptoms among patients with poor thyroid function or adrenal, an adrenal medullary tumor has long been known but it's been relatively recently established that a quarter or more of individuals with cardiovascular disease, even if it's asymptomatic, displays depressive symptoms. In a psychiatric evaluation, it's important to watch for body language characteristic of patients with major depression. These include restricted speech and emotional range, as well as slowed movements or speech. Prosody is often monotonic and patients may display a diminished interest in their personal appearance or have difficulty maintaining eye contact. Any one of these, and especially if you note two or more, should put a depressive disorder on your diagnostic radar. Remember that depression is underreported. Look for red flags like recent significant life stresses such as divorce or death. Similarly, particularly in patients with whom you've, whom you've treated in the past, inquire when you note unexplained recent increases in irritability. Any physical complaint, especially pain or digestive disorders, which have no clear underlying cause and or don't respond to treatment, can be a red flag. Finally, a surprising number of people who go on to have an episode of major depression have a history of panic attacks or a diagnosis of panic disorder. Depression can have major effects on cognitive function. People in the midst of a depressive episode often score 10 or more points lower, that's a full standard deviation lower, on IQ tests than they do without depressive symptoms. Even with relatively simple cognitive testing instruments, such as the Mini Mental State Exam or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, patients with depressive disorders often score significantly lower than normal, largely due to concentration and memory difficulties. 
orientation, registration, and language are generally spared. Although the first episodes of major depressive disorder often occur in childhood, especially adolescence, remember that child and adolescent depression often looks a bit different than in adults. In particular, irritability is more common than complaints of sadness, leading to the mnemonic MAD equals SAD. In addition, although the rate of suicidal ideation among adolescents is similar to that of adults, adolescents are at much higher risk of attempting suicide due to their greater impulsivity. In fact, the DSM-5 introduced a new psychiatric diagnosis, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder among children and adolescents to account for this difference in behavioral expression and to aid in differentiating true MDD. DMDD is notable for frequent severe recurrent temper outbursts that are inconsistent with the child's developmental level with mood between outbursts, one of persistent irritation or anger. Remember that on board exams, you'll often see questions about the frequency of outbursts, onset of symptoms, and the exclusion range for a diagnosis of DMDD. Finally, there is another depressive disorder without a clear trigger that is called persistent depressive disorder in the DSM-5, although it f is frequently known by its older name of dysthymia. The range of symptoms includes six of the seven non-pathognomic symptoms of major depressive disorder. What is clearly pathognomic of persistent depressive disorder is its duration. Symptoms must be present for at least two years, with no more than two months during that time without symptoms. Although the symptoms are often milder than MDD, patients with dysthymia can present full crit criteria at times for ma a major depressive episode. This comorbidity of persistent depressive disorder with recurrent major depressive disorder is sometimes referred to as double depression. Finally, Persistent depressive disorder cannot include mania, hypomania, or cyclothymia. You'll find descriptions of these in Module 5. You can find a good synopsis of this material in Chapter 12 on Depressive Disorders in the Textbook of Psychiatry, as well as in Chapter 17 on Mood Disorders in Current Diagnosis and Treatment Psychiatry, both of which are available at Rowland Library. In addition, osmosis.org has some good pencasts on depressive disorders.